Since we've been in the Gospel of Matthew, I thought for this coming week, we might take a look at a couple of events in the life of Jesus. <clears throat> um, found sort of in the middle of the book, beginning in uh, chapter 16. One of them is uh, the trip Jesus took his disciples on. They went to Caesarea Philippi. It's found in Matthew 16, beginning verse 13. It's an interesting time because Caesarea Philippi was the site of a great number of uh, temples and statues, uh, idols, if you will. Um, pretty much the religious landscape. And it was there that Jesus took an opinion poll. He, first of all, wanted to know what people were saying about him. Uh, that's always a little bit dangerous. I don't know that too many of us would really like to know that. As a preacher, um, you know, there's some folks who'd be for you and some who'd be against you. But Jesus wanted to get deeper than just what people were saying, what their opinion about him was. He wanted to know what they were thinking. He wanted to know his disciples' minds and hearts. Um, and this, you know, in hindsight, they figured it all out. But at this point in the game, they're still trying to think, who is this and um, what's the end game here? Well, as you may know, um, it was Peter uh, who was often the first to speak, not always the first to think, but he was the first to speak. And he, um, he was the one who took on that question. Um, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's really two answers. First, the Messiah, the anointed one, um, Christ in Greek, um, the one who is to, to come and usher in the kingdom. But he went further and said, you're the son of the living God. You're not a lesser God. You're not um, some uh, inferior being. You are the son of the living God. Um, and Jesus responded to that and, and blessed Peter because he knew that at that point, Peter had just simply opened himself up to revelation. It wasn't that Peter had all the answers, as we will see later, as he uh, denies Christ. Um, there was still, still some doubt hanging around. But at that moment, it was clear that Jesus was not just some other teacher prophet, that he is indeed the one that scripture had foretold. So it was a high moment for the disciples. Um, but the high moment gave way to one of the public announcements that Jesus made, at least on three occasions, where he said to the disciples and sometimes to others that uh, he was going to go to Jerusalem and um, he was going to suffer. He was going to die. But he also let them know that that's not the end of the story. But you can imagine that that's where people focused. They focused on, what do you mean you're going to die? It's at that point that Jesus began to talk about what does it truly mean to follow Jesus? We've been studying the Beatitudes, which is like a discipleship manual. This is what you do. This is who you are if you're a follower of the Lord. But he, he makes this statement. He says, um, you must... Uh, if anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Um, that doesn't mean wear a piece of jewelry. It doesn't mean it's a bumper sticker on your car. Um, it has to do with um, the right perspective. Um, who's first in your life? If you think about it honestly, uh, you might think of um, your family. You might think of uh, friends. You might hopefully think of your church. But ultimately, it's the answer to a question that all of us must face. What's the most important thing? Who is the most important thing? Jesus is saying um, it has to be in proper order for you to receive what I want to give you. Um, so it's a clear delineation of uh, how we're to put Christ first and then others and then ourselves. Um, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, well, 
And he's quoting out of the Old Testament. He said, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love others as you love yourself. Well, there it is. It starts with our relationship with God. And following that discussion um, comes the transfiguration in Matthew 17. One of the most phenomenal um, scenes in all of scripture. Uh, the three that form the inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, uh, accompanied Jesus up on the mountain. Once again, the mountain being a place of, of divine revelation. And it's there they watch in wonder and awe, uh, speechless, stunned, shocked, as Jesus um, encounters two personages that represent uh, so much of Israel's history. It was Moses and Elijah. And if you look at it as Moses representing the law, the structure, uh, sense of order, and Elijah, who uh, represented all the prophets, uh, all of that which God had promised and would fulfill. So you have the embodiment of divine revelation there with Jesus. And it must have been an incredible sight. Um, I don't know that our uh, vocabulary could capture the um, wonder of the moment. But it was at that time as well that uh, the father spoke about the son, um, giving his blessing, giving his approval, uh, saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Um, Peter, once again, shows his character. Uh, he is so caught up in the moment that he just thinks they ought to stay on the mountaintop. He wants to build these little tabernacles so that they all have a place up there on the mountain. But the reality is we don't live on a mountaintop. Most of us can point to certain experiences in our lives, um, particularly spiritual moments where um, we just felt very close to God, where we felt like um, our world was uh, in alignment. Um, but then we have to leave the mountaintop. And it's, it's instructive, I think, here that... Um, Jesus makes it clear to Simon Peter, first of all, Simon Peter, you're not in charge. And secondly, um, we have work to do. Uh, and as, as we are followers of Christ, we understand that God gives us divine appointments all the time. It might be uh, in conversation. It might be an opportunity for service. A lot of different ways to go about it. But the reality is... Um, God has more for us to do, more to, for us to experience, more room for growing and maturing, developing. Um, we are not a finished product, as we've said before. Uh, so Jesus and the three make their way back down the mountain, and they found, find a disaster at the foot of the mountain where there's a crowd gathered, and the other disciples are standing around. They, they're encircled by the crowd. They come to find out a, that a, a father had brought a son hoping to have his son healed. Uh, some have said it was epilepsy. Some have said, no, this boy was possessed by demons. Scripture seems to indicate there's more at work here than just an, an Ill, illness. But regardless, um, they, the disciples couldn't help the man, and it was getting testy there. Um, so Jesus walks into this, and uh, the man runs up to Jesus, kneels before him, and says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic. He suffers terribly. He often falls in the fire and often in the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Um, first, from the vantage point of the disciples, it's hard for us when we pray and we don't see the kind of results we want from our prayers. Um, that's true when we face uh, difficulties, uh, health or employment or relationships. Um, what we want to happen just doesn't seem to happen no matter how hard we pray. I'm sure these disciples are trying to do everything they could to help this, this father and his boy. But they weren't relying on the power that Jesus had spoken about, the power of prayer. Um, Jesus said even in com private conversation with the disciples, this wasn't an easy thing. Um, even with prayer, things are, things are difficult. But in this instant, Jesus does bring healing to the boy and brings new understanding to his disciples. And he puts in the midst of all of their confusion and their doubting, um, a renewed sense of dependence 
that was required of them if they were truly to follow Jesus. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know how, how hard things are for you right now. But I do know there, there are moments in my life when I've tried to do things under my own power, when I thought I was smart enough or had enough experience to do this or that. But you learn sometimes the hard way that if you're a child of God, a follower of Christ, there's a reason why we're supposed to depend on him. The one who promised us peace, the one who promised us abundant life, the one who promised that he would never leave us in the midst of whatever we face. When the trouble comes our way, we are not alone. We don't have to face our difficulties by ourselves. It's so important for us to remember that we belong to him and that he has all that we need to live the life that he created us to live. I hope this week will allow you an opportunity to uh, discover anew how important it is to depend on Jesus.